Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. Each month, we bring you firsthand accounts of survival of the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Frank Cohen share his personal firsthand account of the Holocaust with us. Frank, Thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person. Well, thank you very much. And hello, everybody. I'm glad you joined. And Frank, we have um, a short period, an hour, and you have so much to share with us. We'll get started. Frank, you were born in 1925 in Breslau, Germany. Before we turn to the Holocaust and the Second World War, please tell us about your family and your first few years. Well, I was uh, brought into a... Uh, classic middle-class family in in Germany, uh, and it was a Jewish family. Here you see my mother and father and my canary bird. Uh, this was for my sixth birthday, I believe. It was a happy birthday uh, sign that's showing right there. Anyway, I was the only child, and uh, uh, the way uh, middle-class families worked, well, first of all, uh, my parents had a sporting goods store, and that's what provided them with the income uh, to live very comfortably. And uh, uh, as, as an only child, um, first of all, we had a live-in maid, uh, which middle-class families had. And when I came along, uh, they got another girl to help them take care of me. So it was a very comfortable life. And of course, I don't remember anything about the first two years or so. In the 1920s, the Nazis were a small, radical, fringe political movement that was attempting to seize power in Germany, and they regularly engaged in street violence. Your uncle Max was attacked by a group of Nazis in 1927. Tell us what happened. Well, of course, I was too young at that point, but uh, there was uh, legal work that was going on. And I guess I was about five years old when I heard the uh, adults talking with each other. They never explained these things to me, but the kids still listen and they listen and uh, they form their own opinions. And I could hear that, the, that this man who was my uncle was attacked by a bunch of Nazis uh, just because they found out he was Jewish and they had him in the street and they killed him. Uh, for no no specific reason at all, except that he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. This was a bit of a frightening situation for me because I knew I was Jewish, and I heard now that these Nazis were killing Jews. So uh, the term Nazi uh, became fearful to me at a very early age. And I recall also, I looked out of the window from my apartment that was uh, situated right across from a finance office. And that finance office somehow drew a lot of people for demonstrations. And there were fights between the communists and the uh, Nazis. And this, uh, I asked about this, and that was explained to me that uh, we really don't like either one of these groups. And uh, Nazis, again, uh, was a dangerous thing that came into mind. And it just stuck with me uh, for all the years that I was there. Frank, um, after your uncle Max was killed in 1927, Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, six years later, when you were just seven years old. Can you share with us some of your first memories of this period? Well, the first thing that happened uh, was uh, right after he came to power, the Nazis started demonstrations in front of stores owned by Jews as they did uh, our store, our sports goods store. And my father saw the sign that says, don't buy from Jews. And he recognized that this was going to be a losing proposition. And he uh, decided right then and there to get rid of the store and he sold it uh, at the best price that he could get. And then he had to uh, see what else he could do and uh, he turned to selling bales of cloth to either manufacturers or tailors or individuals who needed some some cloth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
we had to, uh, because of this change, we had to move into a cheaper apartment. And uh, that apartment immediately got one, one room where all these uh, bales of cloth were stacked up uh, to be sold. Frank, um, please tell us about your experience in the second grade and about your teacher, Er Schubert. Well, first of all, uh, my first grade teacher was not memorable. To me, he was very old. He was at least 50 years old or so. Anyway, uh, second grade came in, and there came uh, Herr Schubert. And he was a young fellow uh, somewhere in the late 20s or early 30s, I would suspect. Uh, of course, I never asked him how old he was. Uh, but uh, thinking back, I was really enthused with him, and I thought he really liked me. And then I heard he was coming back in the third grade to teach us as well. And I was all excited and I was waiting for him to come. And he came in full Nazi uniform, as you can see him in the middle of that mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon, uh, yep, that's me. And pretty soon, uh, all the other kids in the class started to uh, be in the Hitler Youth and they got all these uh, uniforms paraphernalia that they wore to class, like a hat or a belt or a shirt or whatever. And here uh, was the uh, class uh, that made me an outcast because when they started to sing the Hitler songs, I was told, you're Jewish. Uh, while everybody else has to stand up, you can't. you got to stay seated. Of course, a kid who uh, sits while everybody else stands is not going to be a very popular kid. So uh, I was not. I was not popular. I was. I was an outcast. Frank, how did how did Er Schubert actually treat you in the midst of all those changes? Well, actually, he treated me very fairly, aside from the fact that he separated me from others when they sang their Hitler songs. Uh, if anybody started to pick on me, he didn't want that. I think he wanted order in his classroom. Uh, but uh, that was not the problem for me. After the class, uh, there were kids uh, who uh, found out that I was Jewish, and they chased me uh, yelling, Jew boy, Jew boy. But I, I was a very fast runner, and I was able to evade them. And when I told my parents about that, uh, they said, well, we'll have to change that. And they uh, then disenrolled me from the uh, German public school and enrolled me into a Jewish private school. And I was certainly much more comfortable in that Jewish private school. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, just a few months later, in 1935, uh, laws were passed when Jews no longer were allowed to be in public school. And at that point, the parents would have had to uh, get me transferred into the Jewish school anyway. But I was uh, one step ahead. And here I am in the first row. I think they can kind of put a circle on me. There, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's me. And this was a uh, boys and girls class, different from the public school. But I, I was very comfortable. And I had lots of friends among the boys. The, the girls were scary because I was an only child. I wouldn't know how to deal with the girl. Frank, tell us about your gym teacher in this in your in your private Jewish school. I loved my gym teacher, and I wasn't particularly good in gym, and he knew that, of course. But somehow uh, he singled me out, and uh, so, sometimes I saw him in the in a synagogue, and he would motion to me to come and sit, and sit next to him, and I was always thrilled to do that. And uh, somewhere along the line, he told us about his trip to the United States, and he told us about the skyscrapers, he told us about the Statue of Liberty and what that meant, and then he told us about the horn and hearted restaurants. Now, now those were restaurants where you had to have a lot of coins, and you put your coins in, and you open a little door, and lo and behold, there was either a soup or an entree or dessert, whatever you want. And you could see that, of course, 
in advance by looking through those windows. And I was really all excited about something like that. And I thought to myself, one of these days, maybe I'll get to the States and I'll go to a horn and hearted restaurant after I look at all the skyscrapers and the Statue of Liberty. But I was all focused on that, even though there were no plans at all for me to go to the United States. Frank, through, throughout the 1930s, the Nazi regime implemented more restrictions on Jews throughout Germany. How did that impact life for you and your parents? Well, it was a very subtle and uh, they called it like slicing salami, uh, always another slice and another restriction. And uh, somehow, of course, it made our community pulled together as a Jewish community because we would have no more uh, uh, relationships with, with the Germans in, in Germany. And in 1935, the law specifically uh, segregated us from the Germans. And we had to let go of our maid, uh, Bertha, uh, who was almost like a second mother to me, uh, but she was no longer allowed to work for Jews. Germans were not allowed to work for Jews. And then the restaurants started to get signs, uh, Jews not desired or uh, Jews forbidden. And pretty soon there were no just restaurants that we could go to. And I was in a soccer team, but it was all Jewish players, of course. And we could only play Jewish teams. We could not, never play anybody else. Uh, and so it was, we got ourselves completely separated and uh, uh, but the one thing that uh, became a focus to me was the parents admonishing me to always behave, behave, behave. And of course, mm -hmm. they didn't want ever to have ourselves be called to the attention uh, to the attention by uh, the community. Uh, and I, I understood that I really had to toe the line. Frank, even though this was an extraordinarily difficult time, you were able to celebrate your bar mitzvah when you turned 13 years old. Tell us about it. Yeah, there I am, uh, probably just a little bit before my bar mitzvah. And I had to study for the bar mitzvah and perform in the synagogue uh, by presenting certain prayers and, and so forth. And I must have done pretty well because I was congratulated and then there were lots and lots of presents for me, one of which was a BMW bicycle. That was my first bike, and I was all enthralled about my bike. And then uh, good knows how many pen and pencil sets I received. And, of course, the, congr uh, the congratulations from all my friends and such. So it was a terrific feast that I was experiencing there, uh, being the center of it. And then... Uh, uh, a little bit later, my father pulled me aside and said, I, I have some serious talk to you, to make with you. And he told us, uh, well, he told me that he had really lost the ability to earn a living in Germany and he had to do something else. He had some distant relatives in the States and he was going to go to the States uh, to see if he could find them and get an affidavit. Now, an affidavit is a document uh, that guarantees that the people that receive the affidavit will never become a burden to the government. So the person who is executing the affidavit must have enough money uh, to support uh, those people who he has guaranteed uh, will not become a burden. Anyway, my father made the preparations uh, to leave because all he was allowed as a visitor uh, to take out of Germany, uh, by German law, that is, uh, was 10 marks and a, one suitcase. So all arrangements had to make in advance. He could book his hotels in advance and his, uh, his uh, voyage in advance and such and pay for that in Germany before he left. But when he left, he only had 10 marks. So he was at the mercy of the the Jewish Relief Organization. When he got to the United States, what did he find? What happened? Well, he did uh, discover all, and found all his distant relatives, and they were very nice to him. 
they entertained him and uh, invited him and such, but none of them were, was in a position uh, because of the depression in those days. They did not have the money to support an affidavit. And he had to stay a little bit longer uh, to see if he could find someone else uh, to give him an affidavit. And believe it or not, it was a very lucky thing that that happened to him. And I know you'll tell us a little bit more about that a little bit later. And of course, Frank, while your father had gone to the United States to seek the affidavit, um, you and your mother remained behind in Germany. Um, tell us about the very frightening encounter that you and your mother had at your apartment in Breslau. And also tell us about your parents' friend, Mr. Michaelius. Ah, well, uh, it was because he uh, had to stay longer that he was not home when two Gestapo agents came to our door looking for him. And my mother uh, told them that uh, he was on a business uh, trip overseas and he she was instructed to advise him the minute he got back uh, to report to Gestapo headquarters. Well, that sort of raised a red light in both my mother's and in my mind immediately because we associated it with a story that we had uh, and that had been told about a business acquaintance uh, of my father by the name of Michaelis. And Mr. Michaelis was one who also received the uh, request to report to Gestapo headquarters. And he did that. And a few hours later, uh, he was found on the pavement in front of the headquarters. He had either jumped or been pushed out of a third floor window. And that came to our mind immediately. And my mother, when the Gestapo left, uh, wrote a letter to my father to whatever he does, he better stay in the States because if he were to come back right now, he would be arrested by the Gestapo. And, and Frank, during this time that you're describing, a British informant for the Gestapo was placed in your home with you and your mother. How did that come about and what effect did that have on your life? There was this lady that came to our door with an official document that said that we were obligated uh, to provide her with a bedroom. And of course, with an official document like that, there was no refusal. And we made a room available for her. And she introduced herself as a, as a British lady. And she was trying to be very nice, as a matter of fact, and offered herself to provide me with English lessons. And uh, I, I, I accepted. And I had two English lessons, which proved very valuable later on, although we never discussed that, of course. And my mother had pulled me aside and said, now we have to be very careful what we say in this apartment because this lady is a uh, uh, is, is, is reporting to the Gestapo. So uh, whenever we wanted a conversation, uh, she uh, told me we have to go outside for a little walk. And that's a conversation we had uh, very soon thereafter. She said, let's go outside. And she said to me and asked me, should we go? And I knew immediately what she meant. And uh, this was a rough question for me because all my friends were there. I was on a, here's one of them, uh, Peter Friedlander. Uh, he and I were together on our soccer team. And I had a nice position up on the front line, which I liked. And I had a stamp collection. I had that BMW bike, which I loved. So there were lots of things that would have kept me in Germany, but uh, I didn't really hesitate. I understood that I was an outsider in this country and that the people in the country really didn't want me. And I said to my mother, let's go. And uh, she said, uh, okay, but you've got to keep your mouth shut and don't talk about this to anybody. And I, I listened to her. I had one more soccer uh, play to uh, a team. Uh, the team uh, had one more uh, game to play and I, I came to it and uh, 
uh, I was very distracted and I helped them lose the game. And at the end I said, uh, see you next time. But I knew there was not gonna be a next time. And I never really uh, heard or uh, saw anything about all of my friends as to whatever happened to them uh, when I left the next day. How did I get out of Germany? Yeah. Well, uh, as I said, the next day we were leaving and it was five o'clock in the morning. Uh, we had our uh, suit, one suitcase, just like my father, the 10 marks, the one suitcase. And my mother had made all kinds of arrangements in advance uh, with a, uh, uh, well, we had first class passage on the Holland America line steamer starting down and we had two weeks of uh, hotel reservations and our visas she had gotten the visa uh, and then the next day out of completely out of character she had gone back and bribed a, an official in the uh, in the American consulate to place my name on that visa and it was easy because I was on her passport so at five in the morning we tiptoed out so we wouldn't uh, wake Mrs. Griffith. And we got on the train to Berlin. And in Berlin, she said goodbye to her father, who later died in a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. She said goodbye to her oldest, uh, her oldest sister, uh, but her, her sister and uh, her family uh, got out of Germany later uh, to Australia. But she never saw her again either because Australia was much too far. Frank, you and your mother made it to the United States on October 30th, 1938. Tell us about the journey and about your arrival in New York City. Uh, well, the first class passage was a terrific journey. There is my mother on the Stadendam, uh, and uh, I was really living it up. I uh, had all the enjoyments and the food and uh, whatnot, and I almost became a ping pong champion, but one man beat me, so I didn't quite make it. And I had no worries whatsoever and looked forward to getting into New York Harbor. But my mother was very much concerned because uh, she uh, was worried about going to Ellis Island because she had heard that people who were coming into the United States first had to go to, inter to Ellis Island where they were interrogated perhaps and the information could flow out because she was not a good liar, uh, that uh, uh, my father was already in country. And had they known that, they would have recognized we were not visitors, we were refugees, and would have put us on the next boat going back to the States. Here is a picture I took of the uh, skyline of New York with my box camera uh, in anticipation uh, of what I was going to see as my gym teacher had told me. I did that also with the Statue of Liberty. And I was now all geared up to go to Horn and Hardard. And that was one of the first things I asked my father when I got off the boat and greeted him. And we had our happy reunion. I said, uh, Father, take me to Horn and Hardard. And he sort of chuckled. He said, we'll take care of that. We'll do that. So you went to those little automated vending machines and, and got your meal coins and I got my soup and I got my entree and I got my dessert. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, just, just a few days after your arrival at the end of October in the United States, in fact, November 9th through 10th, the Nazis perpetrated a vicious assault on Jews, synagogues, and Jewish owned businesses known as Kristallnacht or the night of broken glass, which took place throughout Germany and Austria. What, what effect did that have on your family? Of course, this uh, uh, pogrom against the Jews hit all the newspapers all over the world, as it did in New York. And my parents were uh, looking for any news that they could because the people in the States did not have our address. We made sure that there wasn't going to be any compromise here. And uh, so we had no way of getting any direct information. So we were very, very concerned about all of our relatives as to what would happen to them and what we heard about all these arrests and we knew some of our relatives would have gone into concentration camps mm -hmm. uh, and 
but the irony of the whole thing was that uh, this catastrophe for the Jews became a savior to us because when President Roosevelt heard about this and uh, uh, he issued an executive order that uh, uh, stated that nobody would be forced to return to Germany. So our visa, visitor's visa were extended indefinitely uh, and we were saved. Frank, now that you and your mom and your dad are in New York City, your mother enrolled you in the seventh grade. What do you remember about attending school in the United States? Well, of course, it was difficult. And as I was an outcast in Germany in the German schools, I suddenly found myself an outcast again because I couldn't speak English well enough. Uh, and I recall uh, uh, on the first or second day in, in junior high school, uh, the teacher turned to me and said, take the waste paper basket and collect the, collect the trash. And uh, I, I couldn't understand a word she was toy, talking. And uh, she had looked at the window. I thought she wanted me to open the window. I opened the window. Of course, the whole class laughed. And no kid likes to be laughed at. So I had a great incentive to learn English. Mm -hmm. And I did that. Well, first of all, the teachers were very helpful. They got magazines and wrote up the various names of uh, things that were shown in the pictures. And I listened to the radio. Now, the radio was difficult for me because I couldn't understand what was really uh, the, the program all about. But I could get the intonations so I could avoid that, that German accent. I heard the intonations and I... Uh, I tried to copy what I heard, but the, what what really taught me was the movies. And it was 10 cents for a movie, and 10 cents was a lot of money for us, mm -hmm. but I earned that money, uh, believe it or not. Uh, what happened was there was a, a Time uh, magazine uh, program that was shown, a newsreel program, uh, just before every movie. Uh, they had this, and uh, I was invited uh, to have a um, an arrangement as if we were in Germany, and they had a blackboard. I had to stand next to the blackboard with my head bowed down, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, blackboard showed something about uh, that the Jews were the big enemies of Germany. And for that, I received $100. Now, just standing there for about a couple of minutes wasn't worth a hundred dollars. So I, I think they were trying to help a refugee kid, but that money helped me learn English because it paid for all those movies. All those movies. Frank, the, the United States, of course, entered the war following the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. You graduated from high school in June, 1943. Right after your 18th birthday, you were drafted into the U.S. Army. Please tell us about being sworn in as a U.S. citizen during your basic training and what that meant to you. Well, when I was drafted, I first had to go to a reception center. That was Fort Dix, New Jersey. And you usually stay there for three days where you get processed, and then you go to basic training uh, and some other location. Well, everybody... It was processed as I was, and then they left and I didn't. So I went over to my sergeant uh, and, and said, what's, what's with me? I, I don't have orders. And he said, let me check. He came back. He said, well, it's very simple. You're an enemy alien. I was shocked. Enemy alien? I never heard that term before. I knew I was stateless because uh, the uh, passport that I was in which my mother had, was stamped by the German consulate in New York as no longer valid. We were, became stateless that way. But enemy alien, well, uh, he explained, uh, <laughs> you were brought up and you were born in Germany, you were brought up in Germany, you had a German passport, that was the last passport you had, and Germany is at war, and you're the enemy, <laughs> and you have to be investigated by the FBI. So I stayed there for three months, and obviously 
uh, I must have passed the investigation because I got orders uh, to uh, Fort, Jack Fort Benning, uh, Georgia uh, for my basic training. And one fine day, they took me to Columbus, Georgia, the Middle District Court of Georgia, and I was sworn in as a US citizen. And boy, I was proud. I was congratulating myself. I patted myself on the shoulder because nobody else did. And I was very, very happy because I was no longer an enemy alien. I was just like everybody else, and I felt great. Frank, um, you left the United States for England as an infantry replacement soldier in September 1944, and you were soon sent to France and Belgium. Shortly after that, you were assigned to an intelligence unit. Tell us about your training for the intelligence unit. Well, I was a infantry replacement going into, uh, into England and then across uh, to the uh, invasion beaches to Utah Beach. But by then they had built a little uh, dock and I never got my feet wet when I got off the, uh, the assault boat that we got on. And then uh, we went through uh, France and then into Belgium, all the way up to the front lines in Malmedy, where we went to the foxholes. But I must have been earmarked because I never got an assignment uh, to any unit. And they had found out I spoke German. So they brought me all the way back to Le Vessonnet, uh near Paris. Uh, for a two-week course in intelligence. And after that, I became an intelligent agent. So the course was uh, designed after a eight-week course that was given at Camp Ritchie. And some of you might have heard about the Ritchie boys. Well, I was not a Ritchie boy. Uh, I was a sort of a supplement of a Ritchie boy because mine was but a two-week course. And uh, uh, I ended up the same way like everybody else. I ended up with a team, a six-man team, two officers, two interpreters, and the four of us wore the same uniform. No insignia on rank, only the US, US, as you see on my cap. Right. Uh, that was our, our rank designation. And uh, then we had a uh, driver and a, uh, a non-commissioned officer in charge. Now, actually the driver, outranked me, but he didn't know that. And I was ordering him around all the time <laughs> because I needed a vehicle and I didn't know how to drive. <laughs> uh, so Frank. That, that team then uh, went uh, all the way through, all the way to Belgium. And we got into Belgium around the third or so of December, 1944. And then of course, shortly after that, on December 16th, 1944, the German military launched what became known as the Battle of the Bulge, which right. was a last ditch German military counteroffensive against the allied armies in the West. You found yourself in that battle. We have footage of US soldiers during the Battle of the Bulge. Describe for us what we're seeing here, Frank. Well, we were on a defensive and these weapons were being used to stop the Germans, they, they came up. But the picture that you're seeing is very typical because when I, what anybody was going to ask you about the bulge, the first thing that comes to mind was the cold. It was just miserable, not only cold, but it was either raining or sleeting or freezing rain or snow. And we were in, uh, our mission became a uh, uh, looking for uh, Germans who had penetrated in American uniforms. And we had to patrol in uh, jeeps with the windshield down and uh, no top, of course, because we were able, we should have been able to shoot and you can't do it uh, with uh, the, either the top up or the windshield up. So even going 25 miles an hour was a big blast, but I was a PFC and I was lucky that way. I was able to get behind the captain and he got the blunt of the, of the blast that came in the driving and I hid behind him, but he never he never knew uh, that he was helping me to survive in a better way than he was surviving. But we were all cold, yeah. and we never got warm. Frank, 
if you don't mind, describe for us your first night in the Battle of the Bulge. Now, that was the, probably the most frightening night of the entire uh, combat situation that I went through. And it wasn't because I was in personal danger per se, but because of the rumors that were going out and the orders that we received. For example, I was told uh, to get onto one of these dirt access roads and to make sure that no German would come through. That was my order. I had a rifle and I had a flashlight and the order, don't let any Germans through. So I got in the middle of the road and the first truck that came, I stopped him and the guy yells out, what the hell are you doing there? I said, I'm making sure you're not a German. He said, if you were a German, you'd be dead by now. If you want to do anything, you better get in the ditch right next to the road. So I thought, well, he had a point. I got into the ditch. The next vehicle that came, I yelled, halt, halt, halt. <laughs> they never heard me. They just went right by me. So I wasn't doing my job. And uh, then there were shooting going on all over the place. And there were rumors about parachuters coming down. <clears throat> and you just didn't know what was going on. You didn't know what you were supposed to do. And then at midnight, they called me back. And we went into a blackout move uh, towards Antwerp. Uh, we didn't know it, but Antwerp was really the goal of the German offensive of the bulge. Uh, but we never got to Antwerp. We got to Namur, and that is where we got our orders to look for those Germans. Frank, you continue to serve in Europe after the war ended in 1945. In the little time we have left, tell us about the work you were assigned to do supporting the prosecution of war criminals. Well, this was me right there at the document center, uh, the intelligence center in Oberursel, Germany, near Frankfurt. And I received the mission uh, to, uh, with a Jeep, go across Frankfurt every morning and uh, meet a squad of uh, prisoners of war, German prisoners of war, who helped me uh, to uh, create uh, documents that we were sending back to the States uh, that were uh, sent back in support of the prosecution of these Germans who were going to be tried for war crimes. And uh, those POWs helped me create it, and I, I put the uh, label on top of the crate that these were sec secret or top secret documents, and uh, out they went, and that was the end of my responsibility for them. Ton and tons and that, tons of papers like we see here, right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, those uh, could have been the documents that I received and we put in crates. Yeah. And I got promoted in the meantime and then I became sergeant of the guard. And uh, as a sergeant of the guard, it was for the outer perimeter. And we really didn't know who was on the inside of that camp. We always thought it was Goering and it wasn't Goering. Goering was imprisoned in Berlin with the other people who were tried by the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal. Uh, the people we had, I found out later, uh, were people who were tried by the second Nuremberg trial. And these were concentration camp commanders and deputies of the primary Nazis. Uh, they also were tried in Nuremberg and some of them were executed also after the trial. Uh, so these were real important people, but we didn't know who it was. It was very good security. The only people we allowed to in enter were the guards and the interrogators mm -hmm. and the lawyers who were uh, allowed access. Frank, tell us, if you don't mind, about your return from serving in Europe during the war and reuniting with your parents. Well, you had to have enough points uh, before you were shipped back. And the points were how long you were in, in the overseas theater. And it took me uh, oh, oh, well, it took me a year to get enough points for me to be able to go back. And when I reported that to my boss at uh, Shafe headquarters, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Granick, he said, "Oh, I'm going to help you uh, go back in style." And he gave me two crates of secret documents, things like I shipped off back 
to the states. And he said, I want you to deliver those two crates uh, in the port of Brooklyn uh, in New York, and I'm going to put you on a Navy ship. And uh, that voyage on the Navy ship was terrific. It was a little slow, but I was in first class uh, accommodations, in particular as far as the, soup, the food was concerned. I never ate that well that entire time that I was in Europe. And uh, the Navy knew how to, how to feed people. Anyway, I got to uh, New York and then I was stuck in Brooklyn because I came in just before noon and uh, the taxi drivers, they earned their money on these short trips. And at noon, they had a lot of short trips and they didn't want to take me all the way to Manhattan. After the lunch hour, one cab driver took pity on me and took me all the way back to Manhattan. And I had my duffel bag and I got into uh, the vestibule in front of my apartment. I dumped the bag and I couldn't get myself to ring the bell. I left the, the building. I walked through the neighborhood and I calmed down a little bit. And I saw all these places uh, which I knew well from before I went to the army. And, and finally, I was in position to go back. And I rang the bell. And of course, I was greeted uh, very, very heartily by my mother. She was so happy to see me. And then my father came from work, and he was very happy to see me. And it was a wonderful reunion, but it was a short-lived one because just... Ten days later, he died of a heart attack that he was that was sustained when he was at work, uh, and uh, he, he went to the hospital and never recovered. Uh, but at least I had this week or so with him before he died. That that must have just been so devastating for you, Frank. Um, <laughs> Frank, you shared with us earlier you know, about some of family members who were able to get out to, I think you said, five or six different countries. How many family members did not make it out? Oh, goodness. We had so many distant family members. I really, I did, really don't have a number, but it must have been well over 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were distributed all over. Now, the about eight of them were in the, in the States. So we met those again and we had meetings with them, but we certainly uh, lost personal contact with all the others because they were just too far away. I did make a trip to I Israel and I saw my cousin over there in, in Israel and I had planned to go to Australia, uh, but uh, from Vietnam, there was a possibility to go yet to go to Australia, but I only had one chance of a uh, rest and recreation, and I went to Hawaii where I met my wife and my daughter Laura. Uh, that was more important than Australia. Mm -hmm. But a couple of cousins from Australia actually came to visit us, so there was some sporadic personal contact, but the family certainly never got together again. Frank, my last question for you is this. As we face rising anti-Semitism and related conspiracy theories, please tell us what we can learn from what you experienced before and during the Holocaust. Uh, that's a rough question, too, because uh, this is what's going on right now. There's so much hate around, and it's the hate that we have to be careful of and that has to be stopped one way or the other. It has to be confronted, and it has to be confronted early because if you let the hate fester long enough, then it gets so in, uh, ingrained that you can't get rid of it. And things like what happened in Germany uh, where the hate, uh, and the hate is not just the anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism is, like the canary bird in the mine. Uh, it, it's a warning signal because pretty soon the hate spreads to others and others are pulled into this hate and you don't know if you are one of those who are hated or if you might 
become a hater. Uh, anyway, the Holocaust is a lesson, and that is a lesson that I try to uh, bring a, uh, about in, uh, and confront in these speeches that I have. And the Holocaust Museum is the perfect uh, uh, place uh, that sponsors that sponsors me and so many others that can tell about what can happen if you let the hate uh, fester. And uh, I do hope uh, that I am able to continue this uh, and talk to young groups particularly and tell them, uh, learn from history, learn the history lessons so that you don't repeat them. And uh, that is what's so important. And that's why I'm here today also.